Good morning. In today's headlines, Congre Congressman Jerry Nadler ousts Representative Carolyn Maloney. Both served in the House for 30 years, but a new redistricting map has forced one to go. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis learns who his opponent will be in November. Democratic Representative Charlie Crist won his party's nomination on Tuesday. A newly disclosed letter unveils what was taken from Mar-a-Lago months before the raid and what the Biden administration did to give the FBI access, plus an update on former President Trump's legal motion. President Biden is expected to make an announcement today on his plan to cancel some student loan debt, a plan likely to face legal challenges. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, and I'm Evelyn Lee. It's Wednesday today, August 24th. Congressman Jerry Nadler won his primary in New York on Tuesday. He beat his longtime colleague, Representative Carolyn Maloney. The two incumbents were forced to run against each other after new districts were drawn in the state. And today, Jeremy Sandberg has more on Nadler's win. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Incumbent Representative Jerry Nadler is projected to win the Democratic nomination for New York's 12th Congressional District. Nadler has around 55% of the vote to Carolyn Maloney's 24%. A third competitor, Siraj Patel, got around 18% of the vote. Now I stand before you tonight deeply humbled to be your Democratic nominee for New York's 12th Congressional District. Nadler thanked Maloney for her work over the last 30 years. The 15-term incumbent lost her seat in the defeat. When I thank her for her decades of service to our city. New redistricting maps merged much of their longtime congressional districts. Neither candidate was willing to run in another part of the city. Nadler, who is 75, was first elected to Congress in 1992. He is chair of the House Judiciary Committee and led both impeachments of former President Trump. Nadler was endorsed by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He will face Republican nominee Michael Zambleskis in November's general election. He's likely to win and keep his seat in the Democrat-favored city of New York. In New York's 10th Congressional District, Daniel Goldman won the Democratic nomination and ousted first-term Representative Mondaire Jones. Goldman is a former federal prosecutor who served as counsel to House Democrats in Trump's first impeachment inquiry. He will face Republican nominee Benin Hamden in November. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And in Florida, Representative Charlie Crist wins the Democratic gubernatorial primary. He will challenge Governor Ron DeSantis in November. Democrat voters in Florida have chosen a nominee to face Governor Ron DeSantis. This guy wants to be President of the United States of America, and everybody knows it. However, when we defeat him on November 8th, that show is over. Charlie Crist beat Nikki Freed and two other competitors in Tuesday's primary with around 60% of the vote. Freed had around 35%. Crist was once a Republican who served as Florida's governor from 2007 to 2011. He's also served two terms in Florida's state Senate and was Florida's attorney general in 2002. He is currently a congressman for Florida's 13th district and is endorsed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And in Florida's Senate race, Val Demings easily won the Democratic nomination with over 80% of the vote. She gave a victory speech on Tuesday. An America that will come together regardless of who we are, the party that we are in, where we live. Demings is a former police chief of Orlando, Florida. She will face incumbent Senator Marco Rubio. Rubio had a few words for Democrats at a primary night event. To our Democrat friends that are out there, your party has abandoned you. If you're a Democrat, a working class Democrat, maybe you've voted Democrat your whole life because your parents were members of unions or you're a member of a union or for whatever reason. I say to you tonight, your party has abandoned you. Rubio told the crowd he was confident of a win in November. The Democratic Party's been taken over by radical left-wing lunatics, laptop liberals and Marxist misfits. Tuesday's primaries are among the last scheduled before the November 8 midterm elections. They will determine the balance of power in the House and Senate in the run-up to the 2024 presidential election. Representative Mark Wayne Mullen won Oklahoma's Senate GOP primary runoff on Tuesday. Senator Jim Inhofe is retiring early after nearly 30 years in office. Trump-endorsed Mullen won the Republican primary runoff with 65% of the vote. 
He beat former Oklahoma House Speaker and banking executive T.W. Shannon. Mullen is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. If elected in November, he will be the first enrolled Native American tribal member in the U.S. Senate since 2005. He is heavily favored to win November's general election. Oklahoma hasn't elected a Democrat to the Senate in over 30 years. Dr. Anthony Fauci, as you might remember, announced he will step down by the end of the year. He says he wants to pursue the next phase of his career. We know him as the nation's top infectious disease expert, and during his time in public service, he has advised seven presidents. He started with Ronald Reagan through the HIV AIDS epidemic up until today, with the COVID pandemic making him one of the most divisive figures in public health. So we're bringing in Rick Maida for more on this. He is a health law professor at the University of Georgetown and a former FDA official. Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Fauci served in public health for more than half a century, and he advised seven presidents, just like I just mentioned, from both sides of the aisle. So looking at all these years, what kind of legacy does he leave behind? Well, the legacy he's leaving behind is the legacy that the Americans know him for, which is right now, which is a very controversial, divisive figure. Uh, listen, the COVID response America knows has been botched. But more importantly, we have a lot of unanswered questions of, of before us. And in, I think Dr. Fauci sees the writing on the wall, the midterm elections flipping to a House and Senate controlled by Republicans. He's going to be called on the hot seat and answer questions that he's failed to answer a gain of function research, how the NIH was involved with funding the Chinese Communist Party and whether or not the virus was man-made and how it was leaked out of the laboratory. And these are real national security questions that Dr. Fauci is going to have to answer to the American public. Interesting points. And of course, you mentioned the NIH. Let's talk about that a little more because Fauci says he has put his life's work into making the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, into what it is today. So how did he influence and shape it? Well, look, Dr. Fauci undoubtedly is a, a smart guy. He's been around, but, you know, he also makes a salary more than the president of the United States. I mean, he's a bureaucrat that's outlived his uh, time with the NIH. And the NIH isn't without controversy in and of itself in terms of how funding was given. Uh, you know, this is one of the most powerful funded institutes of health in the entire world. Uh, and I think at this stage, you know, the America is looking for a turnover of a new leaf and new leadership, uh, one that gives honest answers to the American public. But more importantly, they're looking for a public health department uh, that specifically obeys constitutional rights and the rights of Americans. And I think the use of public health as a pretext to infringe on, on our individual liberties is something that has been very disquieting for America. Mm, and just before we head out here, what do you hope to see from whoever will take his place? The most important thing we need is integrity. Integrity in the position, honesty to the American public, uh, and respect of the laws of our land when implementing a public health strategy. We need someone who can uh, follow the, the letter of the law while still creating good public health outcomes. And I hope the next individual that transitions uh, does brings that back to the back to the table. All right. Thank you so much for your take on this, Rick Meda. I appreciate it. Thank you. President Biden today is reportedly set to deliver on his campaign promise to cancel federal student loan debt. The plan would see millions of Americans have up to $10,000 of their debt wiped, according to the Associated Press. Details of the plan have been kept closely guarded, but borrowers who earn less than $125,000 a year would be eligible for the loan forgiveness. Biden is also set to expand a pause on federal student loan payments through January. The plan is likely to stir up legal challenges. More than 40 million owe a combined $1.6 trillion in federal student debt, with almost a third owing less than $10,000. Biden has faced pressure from liberals to provide broader relief to hard-hit borrowers and from moderates and Republicans questioning the fairness of any widespread forgiveness. The delay in Biden's decision has only heightened the anticipation for what his own aides acknowledge represents a political no-win situation. 
and Uvalde's school police chief faces the possibility of losing his job. Pete Arredondo has been heavily criticized over this slow response by hundreds of heavily armed law enforcement personnel. The Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District is set to make the decision on Arredondo's future today, exactly three months after a gunman killed 19 children and two teachers in one of the deadliest classroom attacks in U.S. history. The meeting comes less than two weeks before the new school year begins in Uvalde. Arredondo has been on administrative leave since June. He's been criticized for failing to take charge of the scene, not breaching the classroom sooner and wasting time by looking for a key to a likely unlocked door. And in other news, Paul Pelosi, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, pleaded guilty today to charges of driving under the influence. California Highway Patrol released dash cam footage from the night he crashed his car. The judge said Paul Pelosi's plea agreement includes a five-day jail term. He has already served four of those days, and the final day will be covered by an eight-hour work term. The judge also ordered three years of probation and a three-month drunk driving program. In addition, Paul Pelosi will have an ignition interlock device installed in his vehicle and will need to make restitution payments. Paul Pelosi did not appear in person at the Napa County Superior Court. His lawyer entered his guilty plea on his behalf. A federal judge in Florida has ordered former President Donald Trump to provide more evidence in his bid to get back some of the materials seized by the FBI. Trump filed a motion on Monday asking the court to appoint an independent party to handle the materials taken from Mar-a-Lago and return any that are not covered by the search warrant. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, said on Tuesday that she received the motion, but that she wants another filing that elaborates on the case. She's giving Trump's team until Friday to do so. A letter reveals the Biden administration helped the FBI access documents that were already taken from Mar-a-Lago months before the August raid. It also tells us what was previously moved from Trump's home. And today's Iris Tao has more. Over 700 pages of classified materials, including some at the highest levels of classification, were moved from Mar-a-Lago to the National Archives back in January. That's according to a letter sent by the Archives, or NARA, to Trump's attorneys in May, which the agency made public on Tuesday. The letter also reveals that the Biden administration held the FBI access those documents. The archivist wrote that in April, quote, the White House Counsel's Office formally transmitted a request that NARA provide the FBI access to the 15 boxes for its review. And former justice on the Arizona Supreme Court, Andrew Gold, tells NTD, And I don't know why the White House uh, would push this, but um, that's very troubling. Trump, meanwhile, reacted to the letter on Tuesday, saying, quote, the White House stated strongly that they were not involved, but documents reveal they knew everything. Yet others, including a University of Texas law professor, say the letter instead incriminates Trump. He notes that the letter does not bring up a claim by Trump's representatives that Trump had declassified any of the classified materials. Meanwhile, a Thursday deadline is approaching for the Justice Department to propose redactions to the Mar-a-Lago search affidavit. While it's expected to be heavily redacted, a federal judge has said the document should at least partially come to light due to heavy public interest. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And this morning, NTD will premiere a new investigative report on the Mar-a-Lago raid. NTD's Paul Graney sat down with legal experts and political insiders to find out if the FBI's raid is politically motivated. Are Trump's political opponents trying to stop him from running for president in 2024? Is there a connection between the raid and the allegations of Trump-Russia collusion in 2016? Tune into to Epic TV at 8.30 Eastern to find out. And coming up, the United States is urging its citizens to leave Ukraine. It comes as the U.S. believes Russia is preparing to target civilian and government infrastructure in the next few days. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. I can't imagine what the affidavit would say to justify a seizure that broad. There was essentially nothing in the, in the body of this very classified document that gave any evidence that Trump was a Russian asset. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. All of these documents I'm taking 
or declassified. I mean, this is, this is not some bureaucratic process. I don't even know why that was necessary. I think it's just part of the tactics to try to increase pressure on those around President Trump. My colleague, Peter Navarro, is arrested on a misdemeanor by an FBI SWAT team at Reagan Airport. Uh, on January 25th, 2019, uh, 29 fully SWAT clad FBI agents who arrived in 17 armored vehicles uh, with a government helicopter overhead and two FBI boats pulling up to the dock behind my house. I gather the purpose of this was intimidation. Donald Trump, as a human being, as a man who is now a politician, is not owned by anybody. And that's what makes him very dangerous. He is lethal to the vested interests in this city, left and right. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. The Biden administration is expected to announce today additional military aid to Ukraine. Roughly $3 billion are earmarked to train and equip Ukrainian forces to fight for years to come. The package will fund contracts for as many as three types of drones, weapons, ammunition and equipment that may not see the battlefront for a year or two. It will include money for the small hand-launched Puma drones and the longer endurance Scan Eagle surveillance drones, which are launched by Catapult. It will also include, for the first time, the British Vampire drone system, which can be launched off ships. As Russia's war in Ukraine drags on, U.S. security assistance is shifting to a longer-term campaign that also will likely keep more American military troops in Europe into the future. Today is Ukraine's Independence Day holiday and the six-month point in the war. Unlike most previous packages, the new funding is largely aimed at helping Ukraine secure its medium to long-term defense posture. Earlier shipments have focused on Ukraine's more immediate needs for weapons and ammunition and involved material that the Pentagon already had in stock that could be shipped in short order. And in other news, the United States on Tuesday urged its citizens to leave Ukraine. The U.S. believes Russia is preparing to target civilian and government infrastructure in the next few days as the war reaches the six-month mark. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was defiant on Tuesday, vowing a tough response on Russian forces if they attack on or around his country's Independence Day. As Ukraine is also set to mark six months since Russia's invasion, there is concern among Ukrainian and allied officials that Russia would target civilian and government infrastructure in the next few days. The U.S. Embassy has urged its citizens to leave Ukraine immediately. Zelensky also vowed Ukraine would restore its rule over the Crimea region annexed by Russia in 2014. We will get Crimea back by any means we deem right without consulting other countries. As for direct attacks, Ukraine doesn't attack any civilians, neither in foreign countries nor on temporarily occupied Ukrainian territory. Zelensky's comments came as leaders of dozens of countries and international organizations were taking part in the so-called Crimea platform, most of them by video, in solidarity with Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was among them. We must continue to insist that Crimea is Ukraine, just as Donetsk and Luhansk are Ukraine, just as every other part of the country is Ukraine. That was our position in 2014. It's our position in 2022. 
Fears of intensified Russian attacks followed the killing of Daria Dugina, the daughter of a prominent Russian ultranationalist. She was killed in a car bombing near Moscow on Saturday, which Moscow has blamed on Ukrainian agents. But Kiev denies this. Authorities have told Ukrainians to work from home where possible from Tuesday to Thursday. Zelensky had warned over the weekend that Moscow might try something, quote, particularly ugly in the run-up to Wednesday's Independence Day, which will mark its independence from Soviet rule since 1991. Kiev has banned large public gatherings until Thursday, fearing crowds could become targets. Europe's second longest river has reached one of its lowest levels in the last century due to severe drought across the continent. Here are the details. The Danube stretches from the Black Forest in southwestern Germany to the Black Sea in eastern Romania. Its water levels recently fell five feet in three weeks at a stretch near Budapest as a result of the ongoing drought and recent extreme temperatures. The Danube is low at this moment. There are sand rapids between 563 and 565 kilometers, and there are ships waiting to pass. 18 of them are self-propelled and 62 are not self-propelled. The ones wanting to sail up the river wait at 559 kilometers, and the ones wanting to go downstream wait at 570 kilometers. The area's leading water company warned that the sudden drop could threaten its supply of drinking water. I have never seen the Danube level so low like this year. It's very low. I was a kid and it was low, but not like this. The drought is so severe. Even in Europe and in the US is bad. Drought due to lots of heat and no rain at all. At Zemnica, in Romania, water levels are so low that ships need to wait anchored upstream and downstream from the port and then travel, one at a time, through the last available fairway that allows the vessel to avoid sand rapids in the river. The drought has also severely affected grain crops. Further north, the Romanian capital, Bucharest, is surrounded by dried out fields. Coming up, Top Gun Maverick is a box office success of 2022, raking in almost one and a half billion dollars globally. Some wonder if a third movie is in the works. That's up next. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. I love you! Welcome back. Top Gun Maverick has made more than $1.3 billion worldwide, becoming the top grossing movie of the year. It was released on digital platforms on Tuesday as well. The director and the producer share what they think of the movie's success. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details. Here we go. In three, two, one. Top Gun Maverick is the biggest box office success of 2022 so far, raking in around $1.4 billion globally. It's currently set to overtake Avengers Infinity War for the sixth spot in the top U.S. box office films of all time. For director Joseph Kaczynski and star and producer Tom Cruise, it's been a huge surprise. Kaczynski said he's frequently been in touch with Cruise. We talk a lot or email a lot uh, because I think we're, you know, we just can't believe how well the movie's been received. You know, it's 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 what we were striving for. It's what we worked for. It's what you dream about. Jerry Bruckheimer produced both the original 1986 Top Gun as well as Maverick. 
He believes he has the answer to the box office success. Tom has made so many films with so many talented actors and writers and directors, and we're the fortunate ones who've taken that knowledge that he's learned through those years, and he's imparted it in Top Gun, and that's why it's the big success that it, it's become. Top Gun Maverick is now available digitally, but it's still thriving in theaters. Many believe the film has helped movie theaters rebound from the pandemic. What do we have here? It's so gratifying to have people kind of come up to me as they do, you know, almost every day and, and just talk about um, falling in love with going to the movies again and how, you know, Top Gun was a part of that uh, for them. Hollywood blockbusters don't often make it at the Oscars. The last blockbuster to win Best Picture was The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King in 2003. Well, my thoughts are the Academy will decide if it's worthy of an Oscar. I think it's, it's, it's a great film. Audiences think it's a great film. We make it for, for theaters. We make it for audiences. We make it for all the people behind the scenes. With the success of both the original Top Gun and now Top Gun Maverick, some wonder if a third movie is in the works. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Jeez. Having any fun yet? Hey, Evelyn, you want to hear a fun fact about the beginning of the series? Always. Well, you know, Tom Cruise didn't even want to be in the movie, but producer Jerry Bruckheimer, he convinced him. He said that after the Navy took Cruz for a spin in the jet where they were doing 5Gs and barrel rolls, Cruz threw up in the plane, got back to the runway, called him and said, he's in. He loves it. Wow, that's so funny. I didn't even know that, but I think he must be really happy now that he took the opportunity, right? Obviously gained some fans. And even Florida Governor DeSantis released a video of himself in a Top Gun uniform. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your governor speaking. <laughs> well, so this video is named Top Gov, and it has gained nearly two million views in two days, so it actually went pretty viral. Actually, DeSantis is a Navy veteran himself. He served as a military lawyer in Iraq and Guantanamo Bay. He's often mentioned his military service to show he's a patriot. And, you know, we'll see if this ad brings him success. You know, his challenger, Charlie Crist, he's a winner. He was the 44th governor of Florida, as we said. Well, let's see if those midterms will shake up the political landscape there. I'm definitely curious to see how it all plays out. But for today, that's all for today's program. Before you go, though, we'd love to hear from you. You can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. So please shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.